um, as we've come up from 3,000 meters to where we are now uh, across this dive. Let's fly by the really big one over there, please. Do you want to see the big ones? There's a couple here to the west. Yeah. Okay, the network. Good for a uh, bustle move there. We're good for a 20 meter vessel move. Big S1 clade bamboo here. I, I sampled one of these just, I believe, on the last watch. Couple brittle star, brittle star associates. All right, that's good. Thanks, Dan. Uh, sorry, you said southeast. I'm going west because that's where all the. You want to go the other way, do you? I, I want to. I mean, basically, I want to find till we run out of corals, and so if we let's move the ship 20 meters that way, and if we run out of corals, we'll just turn around and come back. I'm just oh, trying yeah. to get a sense of how far down the flank this summit high density community goes. They kind of they came up the west side, right? Uh, they came up the northeast side. Right. Okay. So I kind of want to just find the bounds of the coral community up here. As long as there's big corals, I think Brian's happy. Uh, I want to go. <laughs> I, we can go yeah, the other way. I want to go the other way because we're heading and find where they start. And then we'll backtrack. I'll come over and run the um, southwest side. So I definitely want to move and or I want to explore right to the southeast okay. first. And we'll come back in the corals once we lose them. You can change her to south. I always get those east, west, left, right. And then you throw in port starboard, and it's just, it all goes. <laughs> This is the thickest cluster of big bamboos I've seen this entire expedition. You can uh, look to your right there, though, Ren. Good. Take a quick zoom on the bushy one here, please. Sure. Lynette, can you put the DSC up in the... Uh DSC or uh, put Atalanta up there actually. <coughs> so it looks like we've got two different primnoids right here um, growing from almost the same spot on the rock. Some probably Norella on the bottom and um, maybe Paracliptophora up in this bigger brown one that we're looking at here. We can just get a little zoom on the on the enough to see the polyps. Yeah, I was seeing if I could find a perch here, but I let me see if I can get this. Go ahead, Daryl. <laughs> see, I naturally back up when you zoom in. Come down five meters, please. Oh, this is a, a perm no one, actually. It's a bamboo.
All right, that's probably good for us. Thanks. Okay, go away. Down just a little bit for me there. That's good, thanks. Move south, Lynette. Really? Hmm. Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> uh, you can come up. I'm going to come back on underneath you and then we'll. Try again. Come up easy. So even in that little little jog out here um, t to tether length, you can see it's already thinning out, but we've still got um, a fair number of big big corals out here too, just not quite as dense. I'm gonna uh, to a northeast and then a. Southeast. Yep, sounds good. Can do, she can do southeast, can she? No one three five? Really? Given, uh, given how much the bow thruster was wrapping up and keeping me awake last night, I'm not surprised. It's like seven knots of wind. Am I reading that right? No, 15 knots of wind. can. Beautiful Ritagorgia hanging out here amongst all the bamboos. Martina can do it. I don't think, uh, <coughs> I don't know if that Atlanta USBL is bouncing all over the place. The nav screen is. So because she's uh, pegging the bow tester, is it? Or is she pegging the jet pump? That's why. I'm going to do that little jog again to the uh, northeast just to get us some leash.
doing the switch back down the hill. Looks like two or three different types of bamboos up here make making up this community predominantly. We got the yellow one. We've got this um, kind of whiter one here, and I can't tell if the one in the background is different or just has lost a lot of its polyps. cause a bamboo to lose its polyps? Well, we're seeing, um, I've seen several um, predatory sea stars, coralivorous sea stars here um, that are definitely munging on some of these. Um, and other than that, I'm not sure. Um, it's not uncommon to see bamboos with pretty big sections of their skeleton um, um, dead. And I normally assume a lot of that comes from some kind of predation, but it certainly could be other other causes as well. now. Can we have another two zero meters, one two zero, please? Thank you. Keep it moving there. Let's, once you get there. <coughs> Struggling at the end of my tether here. Well, the abundance is, is definitely dropping, um, but we're still seeing some. So after this n current move, let's let it stop and then potentially um, take off in a different direction. So I think we're finding the edge of the community. I wanted to see how far down the slope it went. You know, I could uh, face this way and pull it for a while. That's fine. No, it's fine. We're not. In, we're not in a great hurry. I'd, I'd rather, should rather stay a little closer to the seafloor and see what's down there and right. move a little slower. I see that. No, nope, I'll come back. I was considering dragging you down the hill for 20 meters. <laughs> well, it will make the video ugly. And we won't get good. Uh no, we're. I'm not in any hurry up here. This is a a, a unique community for this. From right what up. we've seen in this area, we've saw something like this um, closer to the main Hawaiian Island chains, where it was very similar to this. But this is definitely a very new and important um, observation for our community here uh, around Palmyra. Roger, we'll take our time and zigzag down the hill. And I don't want to go too far down the hill. I was just wondering if there was a clear break um, up here. I actually, in the long term, want to go back to the west, but I was hoping to see if there was a really clear break on this community or if it's just going to ta taper off down the hill. So if we can just take a couple snap zooms on wh whatever you've got in, in range here. Uh, sure, but yellow ones, pink yeah. ones. Um, just take 
basically the three right here in front of us that we got while we're waiting for the ship to move. Roger. Okay, go ahead, Dale. Well, let me get closer, actually. Oops. Okay. That's probably good for this one. It's all over the place there. That's why. I'm sorry. Just looking way up. Can we go to this one next? Sure. in here for the floating zoom. <coughs> there goes one Ophiroid abandoning ship. Scared off by our pressure wave. Come down uh, five meters. Yeah, the bounce is telegraphing me. Okay, Daryl, I can zoom in a bit there. for a second. Okay, go tight there. Come on, Herc. Got a couple of benthic tenophores, looks like, in there, too. Those strands coming off of something. Are probably feeding tentacles from a Tina 4. Alright, can we just kind of get a whole colony shot and count the associates? Sure, it can go wide. And zoom in just a bit for me. I'm going to pan right a little. That's good. Perfect. Not much home here. All right, thank you. I'll uh, float up for a, I don't know if you got a DSC, but we'll I think so. Try to float straight up here. Corley, did you get a good shot of this one? This particular one? Yep. Okay, I did get some pictures of it before. Okay, as long as you got them, that's good. Let me wait till it gets a little bit. Mm -hmm. Why am I sinking? Thinking the current is ripping me away. So the current's coming out of the northwest. Yeah, this is. Like uh, I'll just go dead stick here for a minute. You can see the tether whipping off behind us there. Yep. So more northeasty then. Not pretty much due north.
the current's holding the tether tight and then the yeah. bouncing um, Atlantis telegraphing through the totally. tight tether. Um, can you just, can we just run out to tether link due east for me? Sure. Wow, it's picking back up again. So this is gonna this is gonna continue for quite some time. Can we do one more step on the last direction of ship move? Sure. You ready, Dan? Yes, ma'am. Bridge nav. Can we have another two zero meters, one two zero, please? Thank you. This is certainly the largest um, high density um, coral community we've seen on this expedition. Um, and the other one that come, came anywhere close to it was substantially shallower. So this is really cool. corals just hanging out more or less on the top of this ridge. They could go on for the whole length of this ridge potentially. Yeah, with this current. <coughs> Tending out a little bit as current's dropping off a bit it feels like when we drop down. Yeah, that's kind of what I was that that's kind of what I was expecting to see happen this direction, but then we picked this other little thick spot again up. It's one of the things I think might be kind of special about these ridge top seamounts is they just have so much, you know, the whole ridge back is in the, in the current. Um, and so I think they may have, be specially attractive to some um, corals, but they tend to be interestingly deeper. If you look at the distribution of this shape of seamount across the Pacific, um, they are a much rarer shape than kind of the generic conical pointy ones. Um, and geos in this part of the world are more common as well. All right, so I expect this is going to thin out a little bit at some point, but it certainly hasn't thinned out as much as I thought. But I think in the long run, we'll be better off because we're going to get into steeper downhill slopes this way. So I don't think continuing to move here 
is our most efficient course of action. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you all feel about a little move just like 260 maybe to get us out of our own track one tether length and then take off back towards waypoint four just so we can cover a little bit of a different territory and then get back up on the top and then track the ridge going west which will be flatter and so i think it'll be easier for us to traverse so you want to do a track uh to the south of this one yep right here Yeah, we can do 260. Yeah, just, just a little move that way to, to clear us um, out of the seafloor we've already seen and then kind of parallel the course we made over here back up onto the ridge top in the general direction of four. I don't care if we hit four directly. Sure, okay. Let me uh, come around first. Yep. I got a turn for it, run out of tether here. So while the front row is doing, um, setting up for this next move, I realized we dove right into science and I didn't think to do it a round of introductions. So good evening, good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Kennedy. I'm a deep sea benthic ecologist with Boston University and the Ocean Discovery League. Uh, and I am the biological sciences lead for the expedition and the four day watch lead. And I'm happy to have you all here exploring with us. Uh, <laughs> hello everyone, my name is Corley Rodriguez. I'm, I'm a graduate come to the student at the South University of, of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. I study for Manganese Crest and I am sitting in the science seat. Hey, Nick. Thanks, Brian. I was doing an interaction this morning, so I wasn't sure if y'all did in introductions or not. I'm Katie, I'm a science communication fellow and from Corpus Christi, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris. I am the data logger here on Nautilus. Hey, everybody. I'm Lynette. I am the navigator. Dan from the Herc chair. Hi, I'm Ren. I'm in the Atlanta chair. Hello, I'm Daryl Talak, and I'm in the video chair. Thank you all guys for all introducing yourselves. Seems like a really uh, great watch so far this morning. Tons of corals. Look to your right. Okay, Lynette, we're good for that 260 now. So far this entire expedition, we've been exploring um, areas of the U.S. exclusive economic zone um, around the U.S. territories of Kingman and Palmyra. And uh, the area directly around uh, Kingman and Palmyra is inside the Pacific Rhode Islands Marine National Monument. Um, but the area beyond the monument out to uh, the bounds of the U.S. exclusive economic zone, or EZ, um, currently have no special um, regulations or, or management and that zone has currently been or actually the entire exclusive economic zone of this area has been proposed as a u.s uh national marine sanctuary um the public comment the initial public comment for that just closed a couple days ago but our time and the timeliness of the exhibition is really good as all of the data that we're collecting here um and is going to be fed right into um, the decision making process of how best to manage these waters um, and that process will be ongoing for probably at least a year or two um, and potentially much longer um, as uh, the sanctuary making process is, has, uh, a, has a significant uh, number of steps and different places for public feedback and congressional feedback. Um, so it's something to monitor if you're interested in the areas around these waters over the next, or the area, the waters around this area. And uh, so it's something to monitor over the next couple of years. It 
it's always interesting to me that these um, ophiocanthid uh, ophioroids with the spiky arms, um, they jump off. So you, they feel the pressure wave of the vehicle or the vibration of the vehicle sometimes and um, good there for abandon now. ship and run away. Um, whereas their cousins, the Astroschema sea stars, so snake stars that we see also inhabiting corals all the time, never, almost never do. Um, they, they hang out with their coral through thick and thin. <laughs> um, and even when you're sampling the coral, and they, they almost never leave. Um, but these spiky arm ones are real quick to abandon ship um, when they're scared. And it's interesting to me to think about the potential evolutionary driver difference between the two different groups um, that have us make their lives in a similar fashion with generally different corals, um, but how they the different prioritization of whether they're going to stick with their coral or whether they're going to just go bail and go find another one later. So, funny story for those of you diehards who also might follow um, Chris Ma on Twitter. Um, we collected a sea star um, yeah, in yesterday's dive um, that was kind of strange looking. And we sent pictures to Chris Ma, who's a, a sea star taxonomist at the Smithsonian. Um, yeah, yeah, all right. That's to get help, his, get him his ID, and he responded that he'd already seen pictures from um, several people who had been watching and tweeted at him, and he was kind of, I was wondering if I was going to hear from you. I got this picture many hours ago. <laughs> what, what took you so long? It's the power of telepresence on Twitter. Can we, while we're hanging out here, can we take a picture, a uh, good look at the sea star? Yeah, I'm trying to get this a little leash here so yep. we're not bouncing in the breeze. Understood. Snuggle down in the weeds. All the coral biologists in the chat are now offended. Who called their corals weeds? Can you make a coral livery tag for me? Okay, pushing a bit there for me, Daryl. So this is a goniastrid sea star. Um, they're corallivores, so they eat coral. And if you can take a look, all the skeleton to the, its right is bare, uh, and then it's got healthy tissue on its left. And so it's just climbing up this, uh, this um, <coughs> bamboo and eating it as it goes. All right, that's all I need, thanks. Okay, go wait. <sighs> We do another ship move. Um, two six zero. Yeah, yeah, I'm stretched out miserably here. We got Atlanta on, at least on top of us. So I'm a little surprised, um, since the current is coming out of the north, that we're seeing this much density on this side of the feature, which I think is interesting. I would have expected the other side um, below the slope, and it would have I definitely would have thought when we slipped off the back side of this, it would have um, dropped off quite substantially. But this might be one of those cases where it's actually too currenty on the other side and the current, com the current coming up, sweeping over, and then creating some eddies on the back side of um, the top of this may actually be more advantageous for keeping um, food particles suspended, but yet moving slow enough that the corals can capture them or not experience too much mechanical stress from the strong current. Seem to be a lot of particles raining out of the sky there. Yep. 
Wow. Did Wirecam just go fully submerged? <laughs> yeah. I think that's part of the reason why it's so foggy at the moment. Daryl, do you ever have to clean that camera? Unfortunately, that camera has been is damaged from the water, and usually, normally, yes, we would clean it, but due to it having water inside of the lens, we're not able to clean it efficiently. Gotcha. Do uh, one more that way, please. Try a zoom again there, Daryl. Waiting for the ship. It always amazes me that they can hold on. I mean, I realize that they're pretty neutrally buoyant, but they have such a f small amount of surface in contact with um, the coral as they're eating it. And their arms are just hanging loose. I've seen one or two way out on a whip. And it's just, it's hilarious to see this big fat um, sea star out on this tiny little whip with almost no polyps left, just holding on right across its central, um, its mouth. I say central disc, but it doesn't have one. How fast can it retract its stomach back in? Because I figure we're going to come upon one that's going to have its stomach out. They did it, on the last watch. Did they? Yep. Ooh. This one probably does you just can't really it's probably just barely out in contact with the uh, the coral tissue it's really hard to see in there but it's it's clearly feeding so I'd be surprised if it didn't at least have its stomach out a little bit and science is happy but we can also just continue to get some beauty shots here while we're um, yeah, I'm trying to waiting get for the, the ship Atlanta up on top of us. Yep, understood. Get some tether behind us, like not jerking on my tail. One of the things we don't really know is how fast these sea stars eat um, the corals that it takes. Yeah, we just don't know how much time it'll take for the sea star to consume, you know, five centimeters of coral tissue. You can kind of see the coral tissue damage there sloughing around at that node right at the top where it's already dying back. So we're just watching a slow speed murder right now. Yeah, you can call it that if you wanted.
It's really no different than a caterpillar on a leaf, though. Well, I guess it is different because one caterpillar is not going to eat a whole tree. This one sea star might eat this whole coral eventually. How about like a lion and an elk? That's not really slow, though. <laughs> That's kind of fast and explosive. <laughs> okay, me and a steak dinner. Why do you eat so slow? <laughs> <laughs> I'm down five. You're killing me. Question from a viewer in Spain. What are the biggest challenges to this expedition? Um, we haven't really had a lot of big challenges out here. We've, the weather has been annoyingly borderline the entire time out here. We've had moderate currents and moderate winds. Um, but we really only kept us out of the water twice, I think. Um, so that hasn't been too bad, but every day we're like, oh, I don't know, uh, we, let's try it. Uh, we've had a few mechanical uh, hiccups here and there, but you know, anytime you put metal high voltage in an inherently, in, in an inherently corrosive and conductive fluid, um, it's a struggle. Um, but, so we've had a few mechanical challenges, but kind of that's par for the course so this has been a pretty pretty smooth expedition up to this point so are you saying I'm counteracting your bad luck because you said that you usually oh, you're get gonna, you're gonna get me make me superstitious and I don't want to say things out I don't <laughs> want to jinx us go away there Some. Got left here, left and down a little bit more. Can we zoom sponge in, in the very bottom? Uh, yeah, just see off him. screen. Yeah. Right. Okay, Daryl, go ahead. That's all we need, thanks. Okay, you can go wide, thanks. Oh, here's a little patch of them. There's three of these right in a row. You were online. See, uh, so DBL, <coughs> I think are up about five meters there. viewer online is saying that an anteater eating ants in a colony is analogous to a starfish eating the coral polyps. I, yeah, that's probably the best analogy yeah. we've come up with or heard so far. Yes, to the online viewer that just flew into Houston. It is extremely hot, and Houston is filled with mosquitoes and humidity. Yeah, it has been remarkably cool, and even the days 
out here for us being in the tropics. Um, and even the days it was hot, there yep. was such a strong trade winds. It didn't, it was muggy, but it didn't feel that hot. I have to admit, going back to North Carolina and in the middle of June, I'm gonna probably be in for a little bit of a rude surprise. So if if you are all comfortable with it, I would suggest we make the next move a little bit, um, whatever the northernmost west direction is allowable right. by the conditions. Uh, you can go ahead, Lynette. One of the things I'm least looking forward to when we go back home is it's going to be prime mosquito time. I'm going to stay pretty much under you here. So in this case, we can come lower than uh, usual because the current is managing our tether for us. So if we have a nice bow out behind us, it won't telegraph to the Hercules so bad. So we'll, we'll run it lower than we typically would when I'm right under you. Because if you come up, it's like a tight bowstring, right? And it's really pulling on the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'd be able to. There's another sea star. Yep. Another sea star chomp chawing down on a coral. Okay. Another giant. Um, so bamboo, we're kind of looking underneath. If you want. And this is called a gondoros. Hanging on. Goni Astrid. Goni Astrid. Yep. This That's is good on the zoom. Thanks. This is kind of what I was talking about. It looks ridiculous. The big fat sea star out on the little tiny branch. Mm -hmm. All right, we're good there. It's eating an all you can eat buffet. Yeah. Although this one doesn't look amazing. Looks like it's almost. Left. Yep. Can we get a, just a sense of how the coral that's just out of frame, the giant one that's out of frame and left, just give me a sense of how big it is? Right. It's massive. Yeah. I mean, it's the it's the, the you know dimension, two dimensional size of Hercules, from height and width. Interesting. It's sparse enough. I can't really see it at Atlanta view that much though. Yeah, we're looking straight down on it. So yep. That's an impressively sized coral, though. And it's certainly taller than human height. To Lewis and Houston, enjoy your skydiving. All right, science is good, thanks. Roger, moving on.
open the iris for just a second there, and there. We'll look off in the distance. Still pretty even. We've got lots of, a little bit sparser, but lots of big, big, big bamboos. Looking due east there. You want to go by, back up the hill or? By east, you mean west? I mean, sorry, due west. Yeah, military east. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's cheat. I mean, we can. I don't really have a preference. As long as we're in the corals, we can we can hug the slope uh, and move along the same bath bath curve or head back up. I would probably be slightly inclined to head back up, but mm -hmm. um, but we can take our time about it. Right. It. And not seeing down here, it appears to all be ritigord. Uh, I'm sorry, down all bamboos and a little bit sparser than we were seeing on top. So I think we might get a little bit more diversity uh, um, up near the summit. But we can certainly take our sweet time um, and just kind of slowly you know, take this at a take the slope at a oblique angle and head out back towards the summit. All right. Yeah, let me get on the, uh, we'll get turned around here with Atlanta and Herc. I'm on the deep side at the moment. that interests me, these these kind of higher density communities are rare and deep sea life in general is patchy. I mean, you just find it, a lot of it in one place and either not a lot of it or a lot of something else some other place. And understanding the controls of that is something we really are just beginning to scratch the surface of. And so I'm particularly interested in finding kind of the extents of these um, high density communities to try and understand what causes them like why is it why are there a whole bunch of corals in this one place and not so much in the other so by finding the edges um, will help us understand like why one place is healthy or not, is, is super good one place is moderate and then you taper out of it um, so what we're doing we've been doing for the last hour is kind of probing the edges of this community uh, at the summit here to see how fast it tapers off as we go down the different slopes. So we came up the northeast slope. We've gone down towards the southeast kind of corner. It didn't really end, but it certainly started to thin out a bit. Now we're kind of running um, along towards the southwest um, on the downslope side of the summit, and we'll work our way back up to the summit uh, further west than where we made contact with it, kind of boxing in um, this coral community. Um, this looks a little different. Can we take a look, quick look at that one, please? Sure. Go ahead. No. I believe that looks like a back. The one behind the. The one behind, yep. Yeah. The more feathery looking one. So this is a black coral. Um, and we saw a couple bathopathies when we were on watch last. This is probably either a paranopathies or a heteropathies. Um, all right, thanks. Okay, but that is away. a new one for this since we've been on watch up here in this community. Brian, we have a question about the starfish. Um, can the corals regrow or come back to life after, or the coral itself come back to life after the starfish has been mentioned on it? We don't, short answer is we don't know. Longer answer is we do know they have the ability to heal to some extent. Um, but if the, but the, the alive part of the coral is the tissue, not the skeleton. And so if the sea star strips all the tissue off, no, it will not grow back. Um, but if the sea star leaves, 
it can heal the wound and continue to live on just the branches, uh, at least for a while. Um, so it's not, yeah, so there's not, it's not like it has roots or something like a tree where you can cut the tree down and it can regrow from the roots. Um, everything you see that is a lot currently alive on the coral is the tissue around the skeleton. So if it's all stripped off, there's no coming back from that. Awesome, thank you. But as we think about ecosystem processes, it's also, we see these zoanthids that certainly need the coral skeletons to uh, colonize. So um, the starfish actually, by killing off the tissue on some of these bamboo corals, are making new habitat for zoanthids that can come and secondary come colonize the skeleton. a little on the winch when you come up. It's really telegraphing. So it even current. has its own, um, you know, they, they one coral's loss is another coral's gain. Well, you can chase me around here. Good afternoon, Florida. Thank you for joining us. This area does appear to be kind of a smorgasbord for the st uh, sea stars. Could, uh, zoom in on that one, there. Yeah, that's probably good for us. Thanks. What did, uh, <coughs> do you know what Steve ever worked out with the sample that he took on the uh, sea star munching on the coral? We looked for days to get one that had been chomped on. Steve, do you hear the question? We, uh, we work with, um, Steve and I both at BU, um, the principal investigator in the lab we work in uh, is really interested in coral livery and she's been plotting a big project looking at them from multiple angles so she's been doing Come simultaneous projects kind of trying to identify where they are what th what they are the um, immune response how the corals respond uh, to being chomp chomped on um, well, let me try and, get and, uh, and then looking at some yeah, of the sure. microbial communities there as well Has your colleagues found any interesting connections so far? Any interesting discoveries? It's or is still it so uh, early on. Yeah, it's still very early on. Right. Um, we've got like three or four parallel kind of lines of investigation that are all collecting data, but we haven't gotten to the point of really synthesizing any of them yet. Look to the right a bit more for us. So Dan, to ask, answer your question directly, that sea star is at Scripps with our microbial and immune um, system collaborator, looking at the microbes found in the sea star gut. Uh. Look down a bit more for us. Still working on it then? Yeah, <laughs> still working on it, and probably will be for a while. Do another look west out into the abyss. Sure. Uh, 
the camera down out of the lights here. All right, so continuing to thin out, but still, still some big ones out there. Cool, thanks. We haven't seen much in the way of squat lobsters so far. Uh, no, certainly not in this patch. I don't think I've noticed one. We've seen some of the op opiocanthids. We've seen some, um, obviously, a bunch of sea stars um, and a few crinoids, but I haven't taken any notes of any kind of crustacean in these bamboos yet. And it's definitely, definitely not because it's too deep for them, right? Oh yeah, no, they can definitely. We're, we're back in that zone we've been in quite a bit. This uh, expedition, elsewise, there we're at 1,800 meters here. But I also have a good observation. I also haven't been specific looking, so we'll see what happens now that we're actively looking for them. Don't see any here. I also haven't seen any basket stars yet in this dive. Yeah, I think so. Can we look at this, please? Sure. Might just be a dead skeleton, but I can't tell yet. All right, thank you. So that was hydroids, sea anemone. Yep, and I'm not 100% sure on the coral. Um, I think there might be another one. Can you tilt up just a smidge? There might have been another one that looked similar over here in the top right. Uh, loose, by the way. Oh. Don't tell the geologist. Could have been loose. We're out of places to put it. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was going to ask if they collected a rock when they got to the summit. I believe they did, yeah. yes. They got one. Uh, bottom one or top? Bottom one, please. Right. Go ahead, Joe. Steve, what is this? I'm a little confused. All right, that's good enough for us to get an ID later. 
I do. But I'm definitely a little confused by that one. Oh, you got it. Left here, right? A bit, right? Right and up. Oh, let's see where we're going. These corals all just seem so huge. Yeah, yeah. this is a, 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 an impressive patch in how many. Uh, give me a minute. Um, to how large all of these are. Yeah, and we don't see a lot of small ones here. This is another one of those kind of confusing things sometimes as we see corals tend to a lot of times hang out in the same size class in the community, which is a little strange. Ecologically, I mean. Hmm. A little sponge on the back. They're right? so big, I gotta get five meters away to get a <laughs> DSC of them. <laughs> Chris, random question. Are there mosquitoes on Palmyra? Or I guess Lynette, too. Um, yeah, there are. Um, not too many, but we've got um, mostly around where there's people hanging out. <laughs> by the galley and the common area, we get some mosquitoes. And they actually had a started a pilot study to try and eradicate some of the mosquitoes there because they carry bird malaria or avian malaria. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a pre-study for some mosquitoes that they released actually on the big island to try and get rid of the bird malaria out there. Yeah. Um, they didn't finish it on Palmyra, they kind of fast-tracked it because the problem was getting bigger yeah. on the big island, so, so they're still there. <laughs> I'm always interested, these yellow colored bamboos we're seeing here, um, they kind of seem to always, to me, come in groups. I don't know if Steve Osako, if you feel like this too, but like it's rare to see just one of them. Um, but they're not common across the board, but when we do see them, they kind of come in clumped communities. You guys feel that way as well? Uh, 
Are the yellow ones always the clade one? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. There's another Ritagorgia. I'm kind of not surprised as we start working our way a little bit shallower. We're seeing them again. There were several up on the up on the summit, and then they dropped off. They fell away almost immediately as um, as we went down. And now, we're, as we're kind of working our way up a little bit, they're picking back up. Eight or eight thirty, yeah. What? Show it. Wait for the weather to come down a bit. So just thinking about some of the controls of the patchiness of life in the deep sea and on seamounts is uh, potentially thinking the different different organisms have different reproductive strategies between brooders that hold their larvae and and um, they stay close versus sp um, spawners that broadcast their gametes and or larvae out with long um, larval periods and can travel long distances or thinking about uh, microgradients in the flow regime. Um, that control food and settlement um, site choices. One of the most interesting reproductive strategies I've heard of in the deep sea is a type of anglerfish, where the males are parasitic. parasitic yep. Yeah, and they take all the nutrients from the females' system. Can we look at these, please? Sure. Uh, start pushing in easy there as I come closer to it. Good, thanks. So we got, looks like actually a little encrusting sponge, a little glass sponge, and a couple of paramercids here. Just the first ones I've seen on this dive. That rock is loose. I wasn't going to comment. <laughs> I think you can just, can you put that on the porch and go up with it? Probably. <laughs> Never mind. Um, <laughs> and then we've also looks like some hydroids and a little, maybe, little, uh, sorry, uh, chrysogorgid in the back here. So it's amazing when you zoom in how much life, little life there can be here. <clears throat> All right, I think we're good here. Thanks. You saw that little claw sticking out? Or where do you see it? The slime. I'm not sure what you're talking about, wasn't it? This, like, face right here? I think that looks to me like it's encrusting sponge. Oh. That's cool. Okay, Darrow. Oh, excuse me. Okay, Darrow, you can go away. Sure. Chris? 
Chris, there's a um, children's TV show based on the deep sea creatures that plays at the Texas State Aquarium on a 4D theater, and it has the parasitic relationship of anglerfish. And those are like two of the main characters, and it's so funny. Like uh, the male has this like thick Boston accent. He's like, hello, like real deep. And then the female's like this redneck sounding uh, like wife. It's a really, really funny <laughs> comedic duo when you get to watch it on this big screen. continuing to see the community that's really dominated by these big um, big bamboo corals, couple different clades represented here. Um, still not seeing really much in the way of crustaceans. I may have caught a glimpse of one or two shrimps um, down on the seafloor, but no squat lobsters or anything up. It's almost all brittle stars and uh, crinoids living in, in these, the occasional predatory sea star. A uh, question from a viewer in the UK. There seems to be a lack of sponges. Is there a reason for that? We don't know. Um, sponges seem to, I tend to think the sponges show up in a little bit lower current areas and the corals seem to be dominant in a little bit higher current areas. It's not an exclusive rule by any stretch of the imagination, but um, that's kind of my guess here where we're having pretty strong current is the sponges uh, are a little less efficient here. And then to Matt, listening online, those two green lasers are 10 centimeters apart. You were correct. Look left and down, please. Uh, not with a winch, but they're uh, heading left and look down. A joke from an online viewer. Have you watched the new documentary about sponges? It was absorbing. <laughs> yeah. Rim shot. So one of the next, oh, this is cool. Stickopathies, black coral. Good find, I missed that. So this is an anthropotherian or black coral. It's actually a hexacoral. So it's, of the corals we've been seeing, it's the least closely related to all the other octocorals we've been looking at for the most part. I've seen one or two other um, black corals in this dive, but that's the first one of those I've seen. You can come down another five for me. Thinking about like the ecology of these communities, one of the next questions I have to ask myself is, what is the control on the predatory sea stars? So we see them out here. They're fairly, they're relatively common. We're seeing you know, ha half a dozen plus um, in the last hour and a half of our watch. Um, and they seem to have a comparatively for their numbers an unlimited amount of prey. There's plenty of 
healthy looking bamboos here. All the most of the corals we've seen the sea stars on have plenty of more food. So why aren't there more sea stars here? Um, and that predator prey relationship and control is kind of one of those fundamental questions of ecology and different communities are regulated different way. I think about either top down control being predators keeping the population in check or bottom up control thinking about food keeping predators in check and so here we have plenty of food so it's hard to think it's bottom up control um, but then the next question is what's eating um, the sea stars to keep their numbers in check and I don't know the answer to that um, and the deep sea we're really just beginning to understand enough of who the players are and where they live to start thinking about some of these um, more mechanistic ideas of how the ecosystems work about predator prey relationships and community ecology controls um, and I think the sea stars are a really interesting question here because uh, I don't know exactly what would root around in a coral and find one of those and eat it off um, but because they're clearly not food limited given how many big bamboos there are in relatively tight fixes here um, Steve's positing disease which that's a really uh, likely another um, good idea there's one study over in the Johnson Atoll area uh, looking at density dependent disease processes in sponges and basically that they found a whole sponge reef and the areas on the sponge reef that had uh, the higher density of sponges had clearly um, more levels of disease and die off than the more sparsely um, populated areas nearby so that's very likely a, a control, a major control down here is disease and disease spread. If you get any kind of high density aggregation of a certain group or species, it's easier for disease Down. to jump from one, one individual to another. We call that a density dependent process. So we're really dropping the corals off here as we're getting more and more behind the central peak of the feature, the corals are disappearing. So the flow might be wrapping around this kind of central peak here and not necessarily tum tumbling over the top as I had mentioned a few minutes ago as a possibility. Brian, we haven't seen a lot of snails around here, but there have been known to be predators of starfish. Yep. Do you think they could oh. be some down here? Uh, oh. Certainly possible. I've never seen I've never seen a snail predating on a starfish in the deep sea, um, but I can't see why there wouldn't be. There are certainly snails down here. We've seen the snails predating on the crinoids. Yeah, what do eat starfish? We do a bump to the north, or uh, how about through one five? We can tack to the northeast if we want to go upslope faster. We can make a move like uh, zero six zero or something zero seven zero. That'll pull us uphill more, and we. We're past where we were earlier. Yep, can do that. All right. Sure. We're kind of we're getting stretched out there. Okay. the box I don't that makes me really happy to see that this is kind of a boundary line and then reacquire this way so that's working out perfect for me right, it works for me
To the viewer online, yes. Uh, last night we were talking about Endless Ocean for the Wii. Very pleasant game, very peaceful. They do in that case. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> if you got the altitude, do it, do it. No stocked crinoids up here at all. Come down another five. We haven't seen any astro schemas, really, have we? Nope. Same with the basket stars. We saw the, there was one on that Chrysogorgia thing that I'm not sure, 100 percent sure we were looking at a minute ago. I had one, but I think that was the only one I've noted. Zoom in there, Daryl, while we're waiting for the boat. Is that a sea spider? Hi, uh, so it is. I think you're Whoa, right. Oh, cool. What do you see? That's a sea spider. That branchy thing right there is, is. a pycnogonid. A tiny one. So this is also one of the other kind of classic corollivores. Um, these sit here and use a very long proboscis and, and, and drink, basically drink the fluids out of each individual polyp. But it yeah. doesn't kill the polyp, it just kind of weakens oh, it'll it. Kill it. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll eventually kill it, definitely. Um, these are actually have nothing to do taxonomically with spiders, um, but we call them sea spiders. There's also a barnacle here. You can see it Siri out feeding uh, on the kind of next to the um, the sea spider. See a couple what look like feeding tentacles for benthic tenophores there streaming out in the current. You can't see the actual tenophores, but pretty sure that's what they're gonna if you follow those nearly translucent um, or translucent nearly transparent strings back that are in pairs you'll find a benthic tenophore attached somewhere Jump. oh there they are I just saw them Losing the light there. Yeah. Sure. Uh, go zoom out just a little bit again.
And can we, while we're while we're stable here, um, can we look at the bright yellow in the background? Sure. Uh, zoom in there, Daryl. See if we can. Trying to look at that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to see if that was. Um, can you zoom out again? So, Ant, that where we're growing our actual coral, and I think that's uh, actually the, zoom the in yellow on that spider again. Yeah. Good eyes, Katie. I was going to miss that one. I What's the fluffy it. stuff hanging down to the right of the spider? I think it's some type of hydroid. Okay. So that's a barnacle living on a hydroid, living on a coral next to a sea spider. Is it me or does the barnacle like not? like a bar joke. Oh. <laughs> does the barnacle, it doesn't look like shallow water barnacles. Like I would not have immediately recognized that as a barnacle. Yeah, I think there are shallow water barnacles that look similar to this as well. But yes, the classic Gulf of Mexico barnacle living on a pier. A um, this is definitely different. Um, this is more like a gooseneck barnacle or something like that you would see in, in shallower water. So is the spider eating all the polyps there off the end of that branch? That would be my assumption, yes. It's been there for a while then. Yes, I would assume so. And these also um, will, these will attack an enemies too. And so you'll see one of these um, feeding on a giant anemone that's like a hundred times its mass, um, just sitting there drinking, drinking its fluids. And then we've got some kind of other type of zoanthid um, colonizing the skeleton in the bottom center of the frame. That lighter color polyp is a zoanthid overgrowing another dead area. You can see how strong the current is here, how much the coral is shaking. The legs of the uh, picnic on it are, are just being buffeted in the wind. So another really good example of how corals serve as ecosystem engineers here. This one coral is um, host of one, two, three, four other um, types of life in just this one branch, more or less, or one little group of branches. And then we already they know there's already a crinoid elsewhere and pentactinophores. So a little patch of diversity across multiple phylum of life all uh, here just because this coral grew here. Science is happy whenever video and pilot are happy. Okay. I can, uh, see if we can get out of here. I think we got some good B roll out of that. <laughs> Very true. And Daryl, if you if you've got a beauty shot and you want to hold it a little bit longer, feel free to shout and say you want to do a little um, beauty shot work, that's fine too. Alright, thanks. I think we got a good one right there too. Hey Daryl, hit the, uh, on your switch it says pilot, press it down once. Yep, thank you. No, if you want to talk to me, you got to make the little white line there. Yeah, Daryl, what's the name Roger. of your headset? David Clark. Oh, I, so I know that uh, that's not what I meant. I mean, what's <laughs> the station name on the key panel? <laughs> I know he's got the really expensive fancy headphones. <laughs> All the rest of us are stuck with these ear crushers. They're not that expensive, really. My aviation grade one was very expensive. Well, in the scheme of things.
They're miserable. Can we what direction you're facing? Yeah. Can we look at these two right here, please? Right there. This is the left, I believe, is another black coral, a path of pathies, and then the right, I'm unsure of, but probably another paramarcid. Okay, Dale, zoom in there. On the you want to look at both of them close? Uh, no, I know that's a black coral, so let's just look at the one on the right. Okay, push in a bit more there. Yep, yeah, so this is uh, a paramaricid, and these are notoriously hard to get past family um, without a specimen under a microscope. And it's got a big clump of hydroids um, growing on it. Here's a here's one of the astroschemas that we were commenting on earlier. Okay, right, that's great. And before we leave the spot, if we could tilt up and look at the black, the other species of black group of black corals. Yep, there we go. Uh, not Down sure level. which one. The, it's yeah, this one is the one I'm trying to look at. Right. A little fluffy one. Fluffy one. Push in there for us. Yep, and so this is a, a little whip style black coral. We've been seeing that occasionally has one or two branches that we're still trying to figure out if it's piranopathies or heteropathies, but we collected one, I believe, uh, several dives ago, so we'll get Steve Karens or someone to ID it for us. All right, thank you. Okay, you can go away. a ways out, but is that a coral or is that a rock? I'm having trouble <laughs> telling. I think it's a coral. I think so too. Mm -hmm. Sneak in there. Yep, so this is some type of Chrysogorgia. Is that a copepod, isopod on it? Or Sorry, can say again, Katie? Is that a copepod or an isopod on it? I that don't little think it's either of those. It's probably either a shrimp or a squat lobster. Okay. Do we know what these little mounds are on the rock? The little white blobs? Um, I Some biology. <laughs> something. <laughs> I agree with Corley. Some biology. <laughs> I'm not sure. I would have said attachment points, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Is that a C pen in the back? And that looks like a C pen in the back, yep. All right, I think we're good with the Chrysler Gordillo, thanks. Okay. Okay, do we want to start going northwest now? Uh, let me get up. Yep. Up the hill a bit there. You can uh, come up and look down a little bit.
the opportunity arises, if I, we haven't gotten a really close look at one of the brittle stars on these bamboo corals. They're everywhere, so wherever we find a good landing spot, we can do a super tight zoom. Let's take it. But there's no hurry. Like these guys here? Yep. All right. Right there, pushing on that guy. So this is a Ophiocanthid brittle star, uh, and uh, they actually come across the the taxa. There's a Push lot of variability. Bit, right? Some are um, good. Some are filter feeders, like we assume these are. Um, others are actually somewhat predatory. Um, others are scavengers. One of the crazier things I've ever seen in the deep sea. I have to go wide. I slipped off. I saw uh, a brittle star snag a squid out of the water column. Wow. Which still blows my mind. Yeah. Um, and then two brittle stars proceeded to fight over the squid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have seen brittle stars in shallow water capture fish. Um, they hide in a hole and wait for a fish to come in the hole and then catch the fish. Um, so can you try that again? Predation that you would okay. necessarily assume from these things. They're far more versatile than we give them credit for. Great shot of its central disc um, there. So kind of the diagnostic criteria for brittle star versus sea star is whether it has a, a defined central disc with relatively even thickness arms versus a blurred central disc kind of just tapering out into arms like you see in the sea stars. For the most part, we think these are either commensal or mutualistic um, with the coral, meaning that they either do no damage to the coral or they actively help the coral. Um, all right, I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, I can go wide now. Thanks. Go. We're leaving. Could be something. Yeah, we we are aware. Thank you. down a little. Ren, can you look down, please? Yeah. Uh, maybe look down a little more. I'm going to come right under you.
Is that a yellow yeah. bamboo? Yeah, I was actually fixing to say that might be it. Can we look at the yellow bamboo? Er sure it's a yellow bamboo or if it's an overgrown with yellow zoranthids that looks fleshier. I know as bamboos are generally fleshy, but okay, there I can push in there. The structure looks a little different to me. These look more like zoanthids overgrowing to me than the original coral. Yeah, I think that is. That's so anthid overgrowing uh, on an old bamboo skeleton. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, thanks. So it's six o'clock right now. If we want to recover at eight, we should come off bottom in about 30 minutes. Uh, I think Dwight and I said 8.30, so I think we, I would say we've got an hour. Okay. Brian, we have What's a question. What's the uh, trip time? 75 what? minutes or so. What's the trip time? Yeah. All right. So, Brian, we have a question. Do benthic invertebrates thrive in smaller patches of sediment between rocky outcrops where sessile organisms live, or do they tend to prefer vast sand fields? Don't and know the answer to that specifically, but, um, and I think it depends on which level, like, um, You're all right there. You can hold the it. The larger detritivores that need more food, I suspect, would prefer to be in a bigger, in opener area where they don't have to cross oh rocks these, as sorry. often. Um, but there is so much diversity. Oh, let me uh, creep out the, um, 10 meters. Meofauna and fauna. Um, that right my guess is now. there's probably some that are kind of specialized for one area and others that are specialized for the other. Roger. Awesome. Thank you. The patchiness there is actually probably Look, some really uh, to interesting kind of bit, community of dynamics too. Um, there's some really interesting up. community ecology work that's been done uh, in moss tufts, looking at macro micro invertebrates and moss tufts, and then cutting little, breaking them up into small patches or having them in big patches. Look, um, and, and the, to understand the community dynamics of number of species and number of predator prey relationships, and I could see some of these sand patches that are isolated functioning in a similar fashion or I can make an analogy for tide pools too and when it comes to the meofauna and infauna that live in the deep sea sediments. So we have a question from Chris, who is uh, a lead SCF coming out, I believe, two expeditions from now. It's going to be on a mapping leg. And he's wondering, uh, what is it like to be able to use the steering thrusters to get Herc to slide sideways? Like when Herc moves in a semicircle around an object to view it from all sides, how does it move sideways and not just spin in one place? Um. So Herc has five thrusters, uh, two horizontals, two laterals, and two verticals. That's not five, that's six. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but it has basically, uh, where am I getting five from? Ah, the two laterals are, uh, they're like, a, have you ever seen an outboard motor with uh, counter-rotating propellers? It's kind of how our laterals are. So they're in the middle of the vehicle and they counter-rotate and uh, they move her side to side. So it kind of steers, uh, I don't know, it's like a forklift. I don't know if that answers the question. I'll go with it. Thank you. I thought we were going, I don't know, I lost the plot. Are we going northwest? I would be in favor of headed back, heading more towards the west, yeah. Um, maybe still a little north of west. I'd like to find the actual ridgeback. And if that's where we're on now, I think we're still a little on the uh, south side of the ridge. But yeah, we, I would vote back towards more of a westerly course of act movement. Right. Herc actually pirouettes around uh, objects beautifully. It depends, though, on uh, what the bathymetry is like and what the current's like and our position. Sometimes it does a beautiful pirouette. Sometimes it's uh, really difficult just to change your head 45 degrees to look at something because the tether comes out of the back. That's It doesn't uh, pivot around like uh, Atlanta does, where the cable's attached to the middle of the vehicle. So if we're out towards the end of the tether, like we are now, turning gets uh, more challenging because you can feel the force of the tether. So that's downhill. Yeah. Nice. You're looking north, yeah. That way is. Then yeah, let's definitely let's definitely head west. No, I mean west is. Let's see if I'm lost here. That's west. No, maybe even a little south of west. Whatever the uphill direction is, that way. Right. Let's go that way into the corals. That way, Roger. I don't know if we can go that way. Well, let's call it maybe 225, something like that then. That's just where we came from. Okay. All right, then let's just move due west then. going to uh, come under you there. Yeah, there should be a little saddle here and then another little second peak. Right. There. Biological question just came in the chat. Uh, is there any kind of circadian rhythm for the organisms in the deep sea, since there's no light to maintain? I don't think we know the answer to that, um, but we st the, the currents down here and stuff will still shift with tidal influence, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if there was some form of tidally based um, circadian rhythm.
and in shallower depths. Okay, um, you can move the boat if you want. Um, but still in the aphotic zone where it's completely dark, the the deep scattering layer that does its diurnal vertical migration, it can come down as deep as like a thousand meters. And so you get a daily rhythm driven by the sun, even though we're still, we're, that area is below the direct photo zone. So you would have a period for the corals and the filter feeders on the bottom where they get more food. And so it wouldn't surprise me if there's some kind of structure there where their polyps are closed in the day, and then, excuse me, in the night when most of the zooplankton is up in the surface and then they would expect to have more zooplankton availability at uh, during the daylight when the zooplankton are hiding in the depths. Um, so that's you know, shallower than a thousand meters. I think it's very likely there's some kind of circadian rhythm there associated with where the movement of the deep scattering layer is. Uh, look here, left a little more, of course. That's a big whip. Can we get a little zoom on the on the big whip? Yeah, all right. Hello to those coming in from the UK. So this looks very similar to the um, bamboo we sampled last watch in a much, much deeper depth. Kind of red color with the big ginormous polyps. All right, thank you.